Good morning, church. I want to greet you with something that Rick always said in the morning. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody here and to those online. We welcome you. And we're so happy that you're joining us this morning. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Curtis Brown. Dr. Brown is joining us from the Illinois Great Rivers Conference, where he serves as the Director of Connectional Ministries. Dr. Brown is a graduate of Boston Divinity School and Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. He is an experienced leader, pastor, director, trainer, fundraiser, coach, and author. Dr. Brown has been coast to coast. He started out in Maine, or Massachusetts, Westboro, Massachusetts, um, where he served in the Methodist Church there as a pastor, went to the Pacific Northwest United Methodist Church, was in Seattle, um, and finally came to Springfield. I'm sure there's places in between. Um, Dr. Brown lives in Springfield now with his wife, the Reverend Meredith Manning Brown, and his two daughters, Joy and Karis. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Brown this morning. Would you please be in an attitude of prayer with me as we join our voices praying our church prayer. Ruh -ruh. Um, I am afraid I don't know the church prayer by heart. So, um, Lord, make us your servants and worthy of, of, worthy of your love. Um, that's too bad. So we can't do our call to worship either. I will read the line for call to worship. I will read your line and ask you to repeat it. Then I will read a line and then read your line and ask you to repeat it. So, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs and praise. Amen. Why don't we go ahead and stand as we get ready to worship our Lord. This first song, we won't need any words. I, I think everybody will know it, so you'll be good to go. It's come, now is the time to worship. Those 
Dear God, we thank you so much for joining us here today. God, we know that everything doesn't run perfectly here on earth. That sometimes we struggle just to maintain the next breath that we have. But God, you never asked us to perfect ourselves to come into your presence. You said, come just as you are just as I made you. I know you are imperfect and broken. Come to me that way. And God, I thank you for loving us the way that we are, not needing to clean ourselves up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From wherever you've been, come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens. So lay down your burdens. Lay down your shame All who are broken Lift up your face Oh, wanderer, come home You're not too far So lay down your There's hope for the hopeless and all those who stray. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So lay down your burden. Come as you 
And even if the words aren't on the screen, um, this next song is called Broken Vessels, Amazing Grace. Um, if you don't know it, you could just sit here and feel those words. Uh, God loves us the way that we are. Amen. And I'm so glad that we serve a God who loves us in that way. You don't need to clean yourself up, dress up for him. You just need to come to him and love him. And he loves us immensely.
please have a seat. Before we start in prayer, I just want to thank you all for the welcome to be with you here this morning, for the fudge and the handshakes, and your staff does an excellent job in helping, uh, helping everyone get acclimated and reaching out. Uh, this is just really a blessed day for me to be here with you, and, and I hope that, even without the screen, that you can feel the power and presence of God in our midst anyways. Let's pray together. Almighty God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the blessing of worship. Thank you for gathering us from all of the places that we have been this week, from all of the work, from all of the leisure, from family and friends, from task and toil, and bringing us here into this place, which is your house of prayer for all the nations. Help us as we come here to encounter you once again, to find your presence and your spirit, to feel the power of your love and your grace fill our hearts. Lord God, thank you for meeting us just as we are, Bring these offerings of our lives, our hearts, our attention, our time, everything that we are, everything that we can be, all that we love and all that we worry about in ourselves and our world, we bring to you, O Lord, as a holy offering. Transform it, make it into something great for you. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ as we pray together using the words of the Lord's Prayer as we pray the way that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Once again, uh, my name is Curtis Brown, uh, and I am on staff in your annual conference office. Uh, my task as director of Connectional Ministries is kind of weird. It is basically everything else. Uh, and so if it doesn't involve working with clergy, and it doesn't involve managing our properties or our finances, I work with it. Uh, and so basically anytime churches want to connect together to do something that is greater than what one church feels like it can do on its own. So that means our camping ministries, our campus ministries, starting new churches, our uh, disaster response, our global missions, uh, our connections to all of our churches across the world. Uh, whenever any of our 700 or so churches in the Illinois Great Rivers Conference want to do something exciting and they say, hey, what would it be like if we worked with other churches to do that? They call my office and I try to make that happen. So it sends me all over the place doing interesting things. And uh, one of the things that I was doing was uh, had me thinking about something that my mom used to say. So uh, my mom used to yell at us when we were kids. Maybe your mom did too. If you left the door open in the house, she would yell, what's the matter with you? Were you born in a barn? Anybody's moms, grandmothers, aunts, fathers, dads, were you born in a barn? And I always thought that was a weird saying, right? It's like, no, you know where I was born. <laughs> it was a hospital in Anchorage, Alaska. It was not a barn. But what she meant by that was, you know, we would leave the door open, like a barn door. 
because you leave the barn door open so the animals can come in and out of the barnyard as they like, because otherwise you're constantly opening the door for when they want to go out into the yard, when they want to go back inside, and so you leave the barn door open most of the time uh, for the animals to come in and out, and we would do that when we were kids. We had friends in the neighborhood, and we would run into people's houses, and we'd just leave the door open, and then we'd run back out because we wanted that easy in and out all the time, right? The door was nothing but a barrier restricting us from coming and going into this place, into the homes, this place of safety. And she would yell, shut the door, or you're born in a barn. So earlier this year, I got to celebrate with a church that we started exactly a year ago. They were a group of people that uh, started in uh, a new United Methodist Church in Washington, Illinois. And on that first Sunday that they gathered for worship, they borrowed a friend's barn for them to meet in for worship. And uh, we expected that there would be 50 or 60 folks, so we set up about 80 chairs in this barn. And it turned out 100 people came. So there wasn't enough room in this barn. So the, very, so the next week, we were like, we're going to have to get a bigger spot. Anybody got a larger spot? So we got a bigger barn. And the next week, we went to the bigger barn. And we filled that all out, too. And so about... Uh, a couple of months ago, I got to celebrate their one-year anniversary, and they're now filling out the gymnasium at the local elementary school filled with United Methodists who come each and every day for worship. It's a church that was literally born in a barn. I love that story because I'm a huge United Methodist and all kinds of history, but specifically Methodist history nerd. And many of our churches were born in barns because we started as people who were mostly connected with working class communities across the United States. In a lot of our rural areas, that meant itinerant farm workers. And the place that they had to meet was not in the house, but it was in the barn. This year is our 200th anniversary of United Methodism in the state of Illinois. Uh, in October, we'll be celebrating that 200th anniversary. And so I've been going back and reading the stories of our churches 200 years ago and how they began and where the people met and how they met. And you know where the number one place that they met was? It was in a barn. We're literally a people born in a barn like Jesus in the manger, born in the barn. So in 1793, the first Methodists came into the state of Illinois. They came up from Kentucky, because that was the way that Illinois was settled. It wasn't in our part of Illinois first. It was down in southern Illinois along the Ohio and Mississippi River. It's where the folks, uh, first white folks came into Illinois. So they came up from Kentucky, and the first Methodist preacher was a guy by the name of Joseph Lillard. And he came and he held a revival meeting in a barnyard down in southern Illinois, kind of out towards near where Kaskaskia, the old state capital, was before the earthquake moved the Mississippi River. Now Kaskaskia is in Missouri, but that's another <laughs> sermon for another time. He helped form the first Methodist class meeting in New Design, Illinois. And that meeting was led by Captain Joseph Ogle, who was a Revolutionary War veteran and an early settler, and he became the first lay leader of the Methodist Church. So Joseph Lillard and Joseph Ogle, we look at as the first twin clergy and laity that began our first Methodist group in the state of Illinois. Over the next decades, Methodists continued to grow up along the Mississippi River, kind of stretching northward, kind of along that area towards uh, St. Louis and Alton and all the way uh, kind of in that southern zone there. And they eventually formed their own Illinois conference with their first meeting in Glen Carbon, Illinois, which is near Edwardsville, on October 23rd, 1824. So this October, we're going to be throwing a big 200th birthday party because we like to throw parties. 
I can't find a barn big enough for everybody that's going to come, but I'm still looking. <laughs> so that we can celebrate this history of our work together. At the start, Methodists, that first conference, there were 3,200 Methodist adult members in the state of Illinois 200 years ago, both men and women, including 57 black United Methodists. From the beginning, Methodists were intentionally inclusive of women and, peop and people of color. This early com conference two centuries ago, Methodists grew throughout the state of Illinois, and we launched significant ministries that happened in English, in German, in Spanish, in Swedish, in Danish. I didn't know this. We had over three dozen Danish-speaking uh, churches at one point. Several of which developed their own language-specific Methodist conference that focused on immigrants moving into Illinois. At one point, we had three separate German conferences that spoke German, and were filled with German-speaking clergy and laity across the state of Illinois. As those immigrant communities began to assimilate into uh, the uh, rest of English-speaking Illinois, those conferences slowly merged into the English-speaking conferences that we have today. This has been our story. We're people who welcome others. In 2022, the descendant organizations of that first United Methodist Conference, First Methodist Conference in Illinois, are the Northern Illinois Conference, kind of north of Interstate 80, and the Illinois Great Rivers Conference, everything south of Interstate 80. We represent 1,145 churches across the state of Illinois, with 170,000 adult members across the state. Makes us uh, uh, the second largest statewide religious organization uh, right behind the Roman Catholic Church. There are more Baptists, but they're kind of disorganized, so it's hard to count them. So we think there are more overall Baptists. So the third largest religious group, second largest religious organization, largest Protestant religious organization, in case you need a t-shirt. <laughs> we have more churches in the state of Illinois than there are Starbucks and McDonald's combined. We are in more towns than the post office. We are a major part of the fabric of Illinois. Through these last two centuries, the way Methodists have done church has changed, right? Along with each generation. It's not the same as it was when we started. We've gone from all voice, a cappella singing, to adding pianos and organs and guitars. We've gone from meeting in fields and cabins and barns to meetings in sanctuaries, and we have cathedrals and churches and gymnasiums. We've gone from sharing our message through books read by candlelight and teaching around campfires uh, to websites and gathering people for online worship. The ways that we are doing things have changed, but there's something that remains the same. Uh, like that new church that started in Washington last year, we are also a people born in a barn. During uh, that celebration with them, we practiced the chant that they had come up with. They acted out what uh, people would say if they yelled, shut the door, were you born in a barn? Because in some of our churches, that's the impulse, right? Let's shut this door. Don't leave that open. People shouldn't just run in and out. We have people who are inside. We have people who are outside. What's the matter with you, church? Shut the door. Were you born in a barn? That church in Washington uh, practiced saying, shut the door. Were you born in a barn? And then they all yelled, yes, we were born in a barn. And the door stays open for all. Yes, we were born in a barn. And the door stays open for all. You want to try it with me? I'll do the, my mother's part. You do the, yes, we were born in a barn, and the door stays open for all, okay? Shut the door. Were you born in a barn? Yes, we were born in a barn, and the door stays open for all. I love this idea. 
You know, the story of Methodism in Illinois is the story of how we pursued following and loving Jesus by proclaiming the gospel of his love through new ways in each generation. How do we open the door so that new generations of new people can experience the power and the love of Jesus Christ? We have that same faith, that same hope, that same passion, that same love, that same mission as our early Methodist pioneers, even today, but in each generation, we find new ways, new ways of expressing that faith, new ways of sharing that hope, new ways of living that passion out, new ways of offering the love of, of Jesus Christ, and new ways of being on mission to our communities. As our faith is passed, from one generation to the next over the last two centuries, it has been changed, it's grown, it's evolved, and adapted to the new life ways of each new generation. This is what we've done. This is who we are. This is what it means to have the door open to new people and to new generations to do new things. But this isn't just a Methodist or Illinois thing. Passing faith from generation to generation always involves change always involves intention from one generation to share its faith with the other. Our scripture passage this morning is from Psalm 71. And in it we can hear the intention of faith that is being shared from passed from age to age, from generation to generation. Even though it was composed thousands of years ago, this psalm tells a story that many of us still know. We hear the commitment of someone who has come to know the love and joy of God's love and faith in uh, God's promises and their determination to share that faith through their youth, their old age, and with generations to come. Listen to this uh, here in verse 16. I will come praising the mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will praise your righteousness, yours alone. O oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds, even to old age and gray hairs. O oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to all generations to come, from youth to old age to all generations to come. I think many of us who are Christians share this intention, right? the power and love of Jesus Christ that we found in our lives. We want it to stay with us throughout our entire lives, and we want to pass it off to another generation. We want other people to come to experience what we have experienced. We want people to know that they are loved of God, that they are blessed brothers and sisters with Jesus Christ, that the power of the Holy Spirit is there for them in their living. But sometimes it seems difficult it's not always easy connecting one generation to the next. We see this when we struggle to pass on the things that we love, right, from one generation to the other, whether that is passing on something incredibly valued, like the love of our family homestead, or whether it's even passing on something simple. Man, it has been hard to convince my kids how awesome Star Wars is while they keep making the sequels. You know what I'm saying? My mother is a huge Chicago Bears fan, and none of her granddaughters can share in that joy because the Chicago Bears have been so horrible for so long. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's just hard to pass on to younger generations the things that you love because they don't get it because it doesn't work the same way, because it's not quite as exciting, because we're not able to communicate it, because the power that we found in it is trapped for somehow in a single expression. And that power has to break free to be reformed in a way that can connect to the next generation. We've seen our faith evolve, right? Over 200 years here in Illinois, over thousands of years worldwide, we've seen it evolve and change in the way that we express it, but it is the same power. So how do we do it? How do we pass our faith on from one generation to the next? I think that the key is found in this power of God to change the lives of people around us. 
that too often we get stuck on trying to pass off the wrong things about our faith, and we miss the heartbeat of it, the energy of it, the dynamism of it. You'll, you all are reading and praying together, many of you, through the book Dynamite Prayer. I'm hoping that in it, that you're connecting to some of God's power through that study and the practice of prayer, because it is that power that opens, opens, wrong word, that explodes the door of the church so that it leaches out in new ways to connect with new people. It is that power that we pass on. So uh, I love that Roz and Sue chose to highlight the idea of dynamite in their book. So those of you who are reading along know that dynamite prayer is named for the word in Greek that is often translated as power. In the New Testament, we have this word dynamos, dynamism, dynamite, are direct sorts of leadings out of that word, dynamos. And it shows up as power. It shows up in lots of places. Matthew 6, 13, in the Lord's Prayer, when we say, for thine is the kingdom and the dynamos, the dynamite, the dynamism, and the glory forever. In Luke 4, 36, when Jesus is described as teaching and performing miracles with authority and dynamism, and dynamos, and power. In Acts 1, 8, when the disciples are promised that when the Holy Spirit comes on them at Pentecost, they will receive dynamos, power, to do the work of Christ. In Romans 1, 6, when Paul testifies that he's not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the dynamos of God for salvation for all those who believe. It is that power, is that energy, is that explosive compellingness of it. When I read these passages, I don't think power is quite the, quite the right word. We use power very differently in English today. And so in my head, I read the words dynamite. For thine is the kingdom and the dynamite and the glory forever and ever. It is the dynamite of God for salvation for all those who believe. Jesus came and he taught with authority and with dynamite. I love this idea. God's power is not like the world's power. It's this explosive, expansive, untamed energy of God's grace and love for all people. It's not this vindictive or vengeful or coercive power, which is often how we use the word power here in our culture when we think of the word power. We think of power over people, not this sense of energy and uh, life-giving impulsion. Instead, God's power flows out of love. It's an invitation for everyone to experience the goodness and grace of a loving God. It's our own experiences of God's loving power, of God's dynamite in our lives. This is, the, this is what roots us together in a common genetics of love as Christians and as Methodist Christians and as United Methodists around the world. It is this power, this energy, this dynamism, this dynamos that is our DNA as a people. It defines us as a common family and shared ministry to spread God's love to others. Because we've experienced God's love, God's dynamism, God's power, we know how much our mission matters to others. And we're willing to take the risks to be about God's work so that others can experience that power for life change in their own lives. People need to know this in our world. People are desperate to know that they are loved that God loves them, that God really loves them, that God knows their busy, chaotic lives and still thinks that they're amazing and awesome and worthy of love. Our faith isn't just about our programs or our church meetings or our worship songs or whether the slides come up or not. Yay! Our church is about, our faith is about something more important than any of that, and we know that. It never was about all of those generational trappings. Our faith is and was and ever will be just this. No matter who you are, where you've come from, God loves you. No matter how busy or lonely or depressed or anxious you are, God loves you. 
No matter if you can get to church or not, whether you're here in person or online, God loves you. No matter if you're old or young or somewhere in between, God loves you. No matter if you vote Democrat or Republican or don't vote at all, God loves you. Maybe I'm messing a bit. But too often we separate between those that we think God should love and God shouldn't love. And you know what God says to that? Boom! There is no door. It is that faith rooted in love. That faith matters more than anything. I know it. It changed my life. People loved me in a United Methodist Church when I didn't think I was very lovable. And it was through their love that I came to know the power that God had for my life that has changed everything for me. I've seen it change the lives of other people time and time and time again. Maybe you've seen it too. Maybe you've seen it in your own life, what that power of God can do. Maybe you've seen what it's done in your heart. Maybe you've seen what it's done in the hearts and minds of the people in this church and fellow Christians and other people that you've taken this walk with. We know God's power to change the world. It is that power that is worth handing off to a new generation. It is that power that opens the doors to the church. We've seen how faith can reground us in the deep truths that we are worthy of love, even if we have trouble paying our bills. We've seen how faith can lift us up as beloved children of God, even if we fail a test or don't make a team or think our parents are disappointed in us. We've seen how faith can anchor us in the midst of glooms of depression or in the storms of anxiety, how clinging to God's love can be our lifesaver in times of crisis. We've seen how God is bigger, so much bigger than the idols of success or wealth or esteem or worldly power that people say we should chase after. How following God's way will lead us out of the rat race of striving towards these empty goals that can never lead to the true happiness and joy that we know is ours in Jesus Christ. We know our faith matters. We've touched the dynamic, dynamite power of God. And it is as relevant today as it was thousands of years ago to the psalmist, as relevant today as it was 200 years ago to the early Methodists, as relevant today as it was for those of us who encountered it when we were young people. When we were young and we thought this is an amazing gift, and now for too many of us in this room, as our hair has grayed a little bit, We have to cling to that memory. We have to reconnect with that power because there's a whole generation that needs to experience it new. It is that faith, our relevant faith in a loving and powerful God made real through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in a community of believers, in deep and meaningful relationship with people of all ages and generation. That's the faith that we want to pass off to generations of believers and leaders in our church for decades and centuries to come. It's easy for us to get comfortable in church sometimes, right? We show up on Sunday, it's just something we're going to do, hope the preacher ends on time so that we can be out of here, have our coffee, and go on with our normal lives. If anything you hear, take this. This is a dangerous moment for you to come into the power and presence of God. You are asking to plug into not a nice regulated current that, uh, you know, brings in our three legs nicely into here. And you can expect that you're going to get your 110 out of this outlet all the time. When you come to church, the spirit might explode in your midst. You never know the overwhelming power of the dynamism of God when it's going to show up. And when it does, it blows the doors off the place. You all have been in this journey of prayer through the Dynamite Prayer Book, and for those of you who have been reading along, uh, you're now in this point in the book where you're talking about this power of God. For those of you who aren't, maybe this is a time to pick that book up. It's not hard to catch up. For those of you who have been thinking and doing your own prayer, you may already be familiar with how you touch into the power of God. But you should know that this power is a live wire. 
It is not tamed. It is not regulated. We cannot control how much of God's power will show up when you say, God, give us the power to serve you. God, give us the power to reach a new generation. God, give us the power to be a vital church. God may show up like a bomb in your midst and blow open the doors and send you out in the community to proclaim to everyone, even those that you're not certain you want to sit next to on Sunday morning, but to proclaim to everyone that they are beloved children of God and that Jesus' salvation is for all of them. And God may work through the power of the Holy Spirit in your lives to pick you up like those early disciples and apostles and hurl you into the world to do that work. It's a dangerous thing to ask for the power to serve God. It's easy for us to get comfortable. It's easy to listen to our internal voices of fear and caution and normalcy that say, just do what we've always done. They yell at us, close the doors of the church. We got enough folks who are here already. We like the folks who are already inside. We just want enough power to keep the lights on occasionally, God. Not sure we want that explosive power that you have to offer. Let's just keep safe what we have. Like dragons to hoard God's power. We sit on it. Sometimes we forget our own stories. We start to believe that we should try to contain God's power. Try to direct it to work towards our own desires inside the doors of our own churches. This never works. It's like trying to capture dynamite in a bottle. Keep an explosion in a bucket. When that happens, when you encounter the power of God, but your fear begins to rise in you about what that might mean, I want you to go ahead and give that fear my mother's voice. I want you to let it have these words. Let, it, let that fear say, shut the door. Were you born in a barn? So that you can square your hips up. Like every two-year-old in the world. And shout back at it. Yes, we were born in a barn. And the door stays open for all. Dear God, thank you. Thank you that you have gifted us to be part of your power in reaching out to new generations and reaching out to new people. Thank you that you have gifted us with a faith that can uh, send us into the world. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that is constantly opening the doors, even the ones that we sometimes want to shut. Lord God, send your power upon this church, upon all of our United Methodist churches, upon all of the churches in this community, upon all of your children uh, throughout the world, so that we might transform this world with your love and grace, so that all people might know that they are beloved of you. We ask this in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. For the month of April, we're supporting our Vacation Bible School with our joy offering. We have a special announcement from Pastor Steve about what to expect this year at PBS. Hi, everybody. Hot Air Balloon Pilot Steve here, and I'm here to tell you... Oh, wait a minute. That's not right. It's Gold Medal Steve. Gold Medal Steve has a special announcement. No, wait. Sorry, sorry. I get all mixed up. Chef Steve. It's Chef Steve, and I'm here to tell. Let's see. That's right. Happy Camper. Happy Camper Steve. And he's here to tell you that. Man, that's not right either. I don't even know what kind of hat to wear this year because we are going on a crazy, crazy time travel adventure. We're gonna hop into a time machine. Where we're gonna come out, who knows? I don't even know what kind of hat to have because I'm not sure where we're going. Well, I do know where we're going and you'll have to come to find out. Sunday, 
July 28th through Wednesday, July 31st, we are going to celebrate VBS here in the Methodist Church with time travel. Now, we are gonna find out, we're gonna travel back in a time to discover how God created us, God protects us, God forgives us, and God loves us. I hope you'll join us to find out how we're gonna do that. Who knows where we're gonna end up when we step into a time machine. You'll just have to come and find out for yourself. Hope to see you there. Until then, wear a good hat. <laughs> Thank you. As we enter this time of worshiping God through our tithes and offerings, I would like to remind you that the ushers will be passing plates for your gifts, or if you prefer, yay. <clears throat> if you prefer, you may give online using Alexio or the instructions on the screen. Our joy offering, as Steve said, uh, it, this month is to help fund the expenses associated with Vacation Bible School. There's a plate in the back of the sanctuary for that purpose. God gave us his best through Jesus Christ. Can we do any less? Our giving should be from our first fruits and not from our leftovers. Hear these words from Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything the land produces. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with the finest wine. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for giving us your best. We pray that the gifts we offer you will be honoring and pleasing to you. Amen. As we close the service, uh, our first announcement will actually be another video. Uh, Annie, would you be able to hit those lights? Uh, we have a small introduction to meeting our new pastor, Pastor Lori. Hello, Leroy United Methodist Church, and hello to the community of Leroy. My name is Lori Carlson. As of July 1st, I will become the pastor of Leroy United Methodist Church. Let me tell you how excited I am to come alongside and adventure with you and your community. My husband, Dan, and I were list makers. And let me tell you what, for the year of 2024, we have a lot on our list because there's going to be a lot of changes. The first thing that we decided to tackle was getting our camper ready. As you can see, I'm inside our camper recording now. And we've been working to make some changes. We put in some new cushions, new curtains. Dan's been working on all the gadgets. We're getting ready for our next adventure. And that includes spending a lot of time in Leroy. We had to get all this prepped and done ready before the next thing that happens on our list. And that next thing is a new baby in our lives. 
Our son Nick and his wife Lexi are expecting their first child tomorrow. So any day now, Dan and I are going to become grandparents for the first time. We can't wait to hold this little one and to be reminded of how God brings new creation into the world every day. After this new baby arrives, then we're going to be starting to look forward to a new church and new community. We've already scoped out some places to camp around Leroy, and we're beginning to get to know the area. But mostly, we're excited about the chance to meet new faces. Part of my prep work has been to learn as much as I can about the people of Leroy. I've had the opportunity to meet several of you in the church, and I've taken the time to check out your online presence. Already, I know so many good things about the people of Leroy. First thing I noticed is your love for God. I can see your love for God while I'm watching your online worship service. I watch every week now. And I can see how you're continuing to want to grow in your faith. You have so many leaders who have stepped up and into shoes that they normally don't wear to keep the church running, and you should be proud of them. I'm also excited at how many people that you have doing the book Dynamite Prayer. It shows your spirit and willingness to continue growing. The next thing that I noticed is your love for children. I can tell how much you love the kids in your community because of the time and the effort that you put into youth group as well as your schools. One more thing I noticed is that you all love your community. And I can tell this by the way that you help feed people who need food and you build ramps for those who need access and you send people outside the walls of your church to meet needs. Those three things tell me that we have a lot in common. I can't wait to meet you all personally. What you doing? I'm just prepping for the future, getting ready to meet the good people of Leroy. All right. See you soon. And she came by this Wednesday night, uh, this past Wednesday, for meeting the worship team and meeting a few leaders, and then she spent time with uh, the kids in, in Pathfinders and Edge, and everybody got to feel her energy and her, her passion for God, and she's, she's definitely dynamos. She, <laughs> she has that, and we are so looking forward to having her uh, join us July. Um, and our second announcement, we're going to have Laura come up and give an announcement real quick. Good morning, my name is Laura Spencer. I am one of the teachers in the LIFE program at the Leroy High School. Um, LIFE stands for Living in a Functional Environment. Our goal in the LIFE class is to prepare our students to succeed not only in school, but once they leave the walls of Leroy High School. Um, we focus on kitchen and cooking skills, money skills, banking, laundry, job skills, everything that they need to succeed in life. Um, and this year our life team is partnering on a grant with um, some special ed um, assistant professors at the U of I. We are working to increase awareness and opportunities for our students with disabilities as they transition from school services to adult services. Our students receive so much love from this community when they are in school. Unfortunately, we've learned as our kids reach that age of 22 and age out of, out of school that the adult services available to them um, are not often enough for families. So throughout our work on the grant, we have learned about agencies and different resources that are available to our students and their families. Respite is one of these agencies and opportunities. So you may have received an email from Jerry in the church um, inviting you to a community involvement opportunity. 
And it read something like this. Are you or do you know someone looking for a rewarding and meaningful way to make a difference in your community while earning some extra income? We have an exciting opportunity for you. We are reaching out to community members aged 18 and older to become respite care providers. This is a paid opportunity where you'll have the chance to assist and care for individuals with disabilities, providing much needed support to both them and their families. This opportunity has flexible hours that work with your schedule. It typically involves only a couple hours a month, if that. Um, it, so it won't demand a significant time commitment. If you're interested in learning more about becoming a respite care provider, there is an information, information session this Wednesday, April 24th at six o'clock at the Crumball Library. During this session, you'll receive all the necessary information about the role, responsibilities, training, and compensation. Whether you have experience in caregiving or are simply passionate about making a positive impact, we welcome you to join us and explore this rewarding opportunity. Thank you for your time. Our families truly, truly appreciate the amazing support of this community. Thank you. And I have just a few announcements remaining. First, I want to thank Dr. Brown for his wonderful message, Dynamite. <laughs> The General Conference will be held from April 23rd through May 3rd. General Conference is a special meeting. It uh, welcomes people from Methodists from all over the world. It's the opportunity for uh, the Methodist Church to make changes, to review the discipline. This is a very important meeting. Um, and it, like I said, it's only held every four years. And so we really need to keep them lifted up in prayer. We're going to ask for prayers for Mike Crawford, for the other leaders who are attending these meetings. And we're asking to be transparent. Mike Crawford will, in order for uh, transparency, Mike Crawford is going to hold a meeting at 5 o'clock on Sunday, May 19th, at El Paso UMC to discuss, to discuss, inform us what happened at that general conference what it means to our de denomination, and what it means for our local church. April 28th, Staff Parish will be hosting fellowship to celebrate our dynamic prayer se series. So please be here next week. Dynamite prayer study continues through May 2nd. Sundays at 10.30, 6.30 in the evening on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesday, Wednesdays, and one o'clock on Thursday. Books are still available in the chapel. And we have calendars and bookmarks available um, on the table in the back of the sanctuary as well. May 8th is the Leroy uh, Ladies Community Breakfast and Program. Uh, this is going to be held here at the Methodist Church um, at 9.30, followed by a program by Harry and Susan Giles and Sharon Rogie, where Jesus walked with slides from their trip to Israel. It should be a very interesting program, and I hope that the ladies are able to attend that. With that, um, I'm going to invite Pastor Brown to come up and bless us. Thank you all so much for your hospitality this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for your prayers for our folks who are headed off to General Conference, uh, particularly uh, for Mike Crawford, as he's one of our voting delegates. They will be spending the next two weeks, 12 to 14 hours a day, a day. We're gathering some 860 delegates from all over the world. United Methodist Church is a weird organization because we're the one of the, well, we are the largest democratically organized religious group in the world where you can be elected from your local church to a regional body and then elected from that body to make binding decisions. We have no pope that tells us what to do. We have the bishops uh, show up at general conference, but they have no voice and vote. It is just the legislative assembly. And you can imagine when you get about a thousand folks in a room, they're going to disagree on some stuff. I, think, uh, I, I have yet to meet two Methodists that didn't have 20 opinions. Um, and so imagine 860 of them. That's a lot of opinions. 
There are going to be some things that you might see in the news uh, where folks are saying, can you believe the Methodists did this? And there will undoubtedly be things that you think, well, I would have disagreed with that. And there will be things that you think, well, I wholly agree with that. And you're likely to talk to a friend in church, and they're going to disagree with the thing that you agreed with and agree with the thing you disagreed with, because we're Methodists, and that's what we do. Uh, and so don't get too caught up in too much of the news that comes out of General Conference, but go ahead and remember that this is part of our process. Uh, uh, democracy is weird, and this is probably one of the most democratic things we do. Uh, those uh, folks have gathered. We have about uh, 370 of those delegates are from outside the United States. They've been arriving yesterday and today, so we've been praying for their safe travel as they come from um, uh, Nigeria and the Philippines and from Germany and from all over the place as they're coming together. And then a lot of our delegates uh, from the U.S., including most of our Illinois Great Rivers delegates, and we have 10, five lay and for five clergy, uh, are traveling tomorrow. So uh, prayers for their safety and their travels as well. So let us pray. Thank you, God, so much for gathering us. Thank you for the gifts of your people. Thank you for the way that you show up in power when we invite you into our lives. Watch and keep us as we go into the world. Bless all of your servants as they are at work in all of the different ways, through Vacation Bible School, through the respite program, through the ways that we are connecting with people and communities. Uh, bless Pastor Lori and her husband as they are preparing to come. Bless all of us. Let us be filled with your power, with your dynamism, with your dynamos, so that we might do your work. Go now in, from this place in the power and presence of God to love and serve Christ in all that you do. Go in peace this day. Amen.